Uh, hello. Yeah, my name is Adam Collins. I just want to, you know, thank everyone for having me. So the main significance of this work is to get to a fully automated water depth prediction in the surf zone. Bathymetry, which is just the measurement of depth of water in ocean, seas, or lakes, is important for a variety of uses. For the near shore area, practically, it enhances the personal safety of beachgoers by being able to detect gaps in sandbars where rip currents are likely to form, and for identifying navigable areas for both industrial and military uses. In addition, bathymetry has a first order impact on near shore and surf zone hydrodynamics with the bottom boundary condition being one of the most important inputs for numerical simulations of near shore and surf zone processes. However, typically survey techniques are expensive and time consuming require specialized equipment and are not feasible in a variety of situations. The cheapest method in the near shore would probably be mounting an RTK unit to a jet ski and using acoustic readings to measure the water depth. However, waves and other obstacles create challenges. For example, it's not feasible to use a small man craft to measure the bathymetry during larger wave conditions, such as during storms. The other pictures actually show an example of specialized equipment available to the Army Corps of Engineers in Duck, North Carolina for measuring surf zone bathymetry. This is a land water amphibious vehicle and a crab unit. Though these units are pretty unique to the facility and which exemplifies the difficulty in getting accurate surf zone bathymetries in other locations around the world. Surf zone bathymetry is also challenging not only because you are battling waves, but because of the constant change of the bathymetry itself in the surf zone. Accretive and erosive processes typically do not happen in deep water. In the deep ocean, you do not have to take bathymetric surveys very often because the ocean floor is relatively constant over shorter time scales. This is because wave interactions with the bottom do not happen in deep water. Waves only begin interacting and affecting the bottom when water depth is greater than half of their wavelength. Once waves begin interacting with the bottom in shallow water, sediment transports due to currents and waves change the bathymetric profile on hourly timescales. For example, in the picture on the left, you can see typical seasonal changes uh, on a sandy beach in the North Atlantic with erosion happening during the winter and accretion happening during the summer. Storm events, however, can add or wipe out some of these sandbar features in a matter of hours. Because of these difficulties of the dangers of high wave energies, limited manpower, and constantly changing profiles, it would be advantageous to have a way to estimate this bathymetry without directly having to measure the depth, such as by using observations of the sea surface. So now I'm just going to talk real quick about some ways people have tried to take observations of the sea surface and turn them into reliable bathymetric predictions. The mechanism that I'm going to describe and that we use here is breaking waves to water depth. Wave behavior in shallow water is largely controlled by water depth. As waves come onto the beach, they get slower as water gets shallower. Because of the conservation of energy density flux and a decrease in water depth, it actually pushes the water upward, increasing the wave height as it moves closer to the beach, which is called shoaling. Also, waves tend to break in water depths between 0.4 and 0.8 of their wave height. Because of this, more waves tend to break in areas where the water depth is much lower, such as over sandbars, when, and when coming onto the shoreline. This creates an inverse physics problem where we can relate wave, the wave breaking field to water depth. Well, what about the technologies used for this? Nearshore remote sensing platforms such as UAVs, satellites, and towers, like pictured here, now provide high resolution imagery of the sea surface. This imagery can be exploited by using our understanding of wave transformation and breaking to estimate water depths. However, the surf zone bathymetric inversion process has many technical challenges in using this high resolution data to predict water depth. One of the techniques in converting this high resolution imagery and information useful to bathymetric inversion is to create time average images of the surf zone. Here you see an example movie um, from a UAV over in Duck, North Carolina. 
you can see the waves breaking over the sandbar offshore because the water is shallower there. Um, this uh, video imagery of the surf zone is then averaged over long time scales from anywhere from 10 minutes to entire days to create Timex images like the one you see here. Persistent regions of wave breaking will appear as white bands in this Timex imagery. And while these areas are easy to identify by human observation, it's more difficult for typical image processing algorithms to accurately capture these features. One of the approaches of using Timex images for bathymetry inversion is the parametric beach tool. In the 2D implementation, a mean shoreline is input by the user. You can see an example here. And the normal transects from the shoreline are calculated. The distance from the shoreline to the sandbar using expert identification with time-lapsed images is also input to the model, along with an estimated offshore depth in the beach slope. The center image here is the predicted bathymetry with the measured bathymetry on the right. Uh, this inversion model was tested and showed to have a mean bias and root mean square of 0.27 meters and 0.59 meters respectively in Duck, North Carolina. Another approach is known as Beach Wizard, which uses a few different methodologies, one of which is using video of wave roller dissipation and variation of the intertidal shoreline, which are then time averaged, and you can see an example of that here. These observations are compared to outputs of model runs being initialized by a snapshot guess. Through an optimal least squares estimator approach, the bathymetry is adjusted for gradually to improve the fit between model output and observations. You can see an example of this here in the figure where the dashed red line is the initial guess, the blue line is the measured bathymetry, and the solid red line is the final guess along with error bars. Now I will quickly present our data and model setups. So we chose to use deep neural networks for our bathymetric inversion problem because of their ability to produce state-of-the-art results on pixel-wise classification and depth regression and other remote sensing data sets. Also, deep neural networks have very little computational overhead and operational cost once they are trained to make a prediction. This would produce significantly quicker predictions compared to the typical physics-based inversion processes that typically involve expert identification. Because of these advantages, we look to explore the feasibility of using deep neural networks to interpret oceanographic data sources and the predictions using model inversion methods. However, as we all know, the downsides of deep neural networks include procuring large data sets for training the model. And so oceanographic data sets with high resolution imagery that is coincident with accurate bathymetric measurements is very small with the Duck North Carolina data set being unique, both in its me measurement frequency and accuracy. However, it's been shown that training models with synthetic data sets and then fine tuning them with smaller subsets of real data has worked with other depth regression tasks. And we hope to replicate that approach here. So the type of neural network we are choosing to use for the model is a fully convolutional neural network. In particular, it's a Bayesian encoder decoder version of UNET that is modified to fit the input data size. Um, we also chose to use these fully convolutional neural networks because they produce prediction maps of the same dimensions of the input feature set, which in this case is the time image, the Timex image, and the average offshore slope. So the wave model that we chose to run this inversion process with is the Solaris wave model. It's an open source Boussin-esque type wave solver that runs on a GPU. It produces photorealistic visualizations of different aspects of wave transformation, like shoaling, refraction, reflection, and breaking. In addition, it has extremely efficient real-time runtime which is very significant because most other wave models uh, of this type can take days to simulate on a supercomputer over domains sim similar as this. For the Solaris model to run, however, we need two main inputs, the bathymetry for the waves to run over and the wave conditions at the offshore boundary layer for the waves to propagate from. 
So the first input to this Solaris wave model is, of course, the bathymetry. So here uh, is an ex a cross-shore hex spin density map of the bathymetries. And a set of 100 were generated using an empirical orthogonal approach based on 40 years of our bathymetric surveys that were taken in Duck, North Carolina. The y-axis is elevation. And the red line shows the still water level. And the x-axis is the cross-shore distance. These bathymetries are about 1,800 meters in the alongshore direction and 970 meters in the crossshore direction. The crossshore distance of these is chosen because that is the location of the FRS eight meter water depth pressure sensor array. This pressure sensor array is where the wave conditions were measured that we are using to input into Solaris to force the wave model. To increase variation in the training and testing data sets for overall generalization of the model, we also created a tool to develop fully synthetic bathymetries that were not based on Duck North Carolina. This is important because while the historical Duck and Sea data is slated completely in real observations, they are only of one type of beach. And there are many different types of beaches around the world, such as multi sandbar beaches that are not normally observed in Duck. And these additional bathymetries should help the model generalize to different types of beach morphologies. To do this, we first create a noisy parametric slope. We then created sandbar, trough, and spot-like perturbations around a mean of zero of random amounts, intensities, and locations. These are then combined, smoothed, and stretched to give a composite bathymetric profile. Here is the comparison density map between the two bathymetric approaches. Again, the red line is the still water level. The synthetic approach generated a far more varied set of bathymetries, which should help the generalization of the ML algorithm. I would like to point out again that in both cases, the cross shore cutoff is right around eight meters of water depth, which is the water depth that the following wave condition observations were taken. So the wave conditions, again, are just the numbers that are used to force the Solaris wave model to propagate waves from the offshore boundary over our selected bathymetry. Wave boundary conditions were derived from a sampling at the eight meter water depth pressure array. On the left, you can see these historical observations bend by significant wave height and direction over 10 years. With up is zero degrees true north, and each bend represents a half meter increment in wave height with the color representing the percent occurrence of this type of wave condition. For instance, you can see that wave conditions between 45 degrees and 67.5 degrees with a wave height between 0.5 and 1 happened about 6% of the time over this 10 year period. For these most common occurrences, we get peak, peak wave heights ranging from 0.7 to 2.5 meters, peak periods ranging from five seconds to 11 seconds, and peak directions between 45 degrees and 112.5. Here is a table of the most common wave observations ordered that I just displayed into in that uh, wave rose chart. For each column, the blue values are relatively low, while the red values are relatively high. For example, we can see that wave height, which here is labeled H, is most commonly very low with the top six most common conditions all being below one meter. Because of effects like this, we also chose less likely to occur wave conditions and they were added to add more variation in wave height and period than what's seen in just the top few conditions. Here you can see a graph where the x-axis shows the peak frequency of the wave condition and the y-axis shows the wave height. Measured observations are shown in orange. You can probably easily see the problem with trying to initialize a robust synthetic training data set with only the likely measured observations. To combat this, a light and hypercube approach was used in parameter space to generate synthetic wave conditions, which are shown in blue, for additional training and testing data that weren't observed in Duck, North Carolina, but could easily be observed at other global locations. Additionally, here is a very similar graph, but instead of wave height on the y-axis, we see wave direction plotted against frequency. And again, the orange dots are the measured, uh, the most probabilistic measured occurrences in duck, 
and the blue were generated using a Latin hypercube approach. So a bathymetry and wave condition are then input into the wave model, a sample output, which is shown right here. 20 minutes of this wave visualization are then recorded after 10 minutes of spin up time. 8,000 frames of the visualization are averaged together to form one of these Timex images. And then the center portion of the image is cut out into a square, both for the ease of input into an FCN, but also because of the edge shadowing effects along the northern and southern boundaries caused by the sponge layers of these locations in the wave model. Now I'll quickly discuss some of the preliminary results that we have shown on these synthetic data sets. So the database setup is as follows. We have 1700 training images of 1960 different model runs, broken down as 80 bathymetries ran over 10 measured wave conditions and 12 synthetic wave conditions selected by Latin hypercube approach for the training data. And then we had 200 validation images of 10 bathymetries ran over these same wave conditions. In addition, bad runs were where the videos would be distorted for some various reasons, and so we removed those from the training data set, giving us slightly less than 1960 uh, training images. Our test set for this report consisted of 150 testing images of 10 bathymetries, ran over 15 synthetic wave conditions selected from the Latin hypercube at random that were not seen during training. In the top left, you can see an example of the Timex portion of the input features, along with the ground truth here and the predicted elevation on the top right. Below the Timex, you can see the ground truth cross shore transect in cyan and the predicted transect in black. Then we have a cross shore transect here of the averaged RMS values averaged along the alongshore position as well as the offshore bias between the predicted and truth elevation. In this, the blue is prediction is too deep and red is the prediction is too shallow. In this example, the wave height is 2.1 meters, the period 11 seconds, and the direction 80 degrees. This image has a very wide surf zone, which is defined as the region where waves are breaking. Therefore, there is pretty good accuracy and agreement nearly everywhere except very far offshore where there's very little to no breaking waves give information to the algorithm. This is a doubled sandbar example, which you can see here. So you can see the sandbar here and then the one further offshore. And for this example, the wave height is 1.1 meters, the period seven seconds and the direction 103 degrees. The surf zone is relatively small in this image with smaller wave heights creating less breaking seaward of the sandbar, though you can see a couple waves did break over the second sandbar far offshore. Because there are so few of these breaking waves offshore, the networks assumes it is deeper than it really is, which you can easily see on the cross shore transect overlays. However, because so few of the waves are breaking here at the sandbar, they roll in and are able to break along the shoreline allowing the machine learning model to see a longer gradient of breaking pattern approaching the shoreline, which aids its accurate prediction of the trough area shoreward of the sandbar. In this example, we see the exact same bathymetry, but this time the wave height is 1.9 meters, the period seven seconds and the direction 86 degrees. The surf zone in this image is much larger with the larger wave height creating more breaking in the deeper areas seaward of the sandbar. As you can see with our human vision, the apparent sandbar out there is becoming more apparent and the algorithm sees it as well, predicting the more seaward sandbar with greater accuracy. However, with more of the wave energy being dissipated offshore and over the sandbar, we see fewer waves breaking on the shoreline than in the previous example. You can see that this causes more inaccuracy in the trough re region short of the sandbar relative to the last example. This here is a comparison that shows the summary statistics from three approaches of training and testing this ML model. Blue is using the same wave condition seen during training in the test set. 
Orange is using unique wave conditions not seen during training. And green is using only the measured wave conditions as training samples, which produces a training data set about half as large as our full data set is currently. In all cases, the bathymetries were unique to the test set and not seen during training. In general, the wave conditions that the ML model saw during training yielded better results than unique wave conditions. However, the differences, while reproducible when shuffling and training the data set, do not really seem large enough to in indicate that an expansion of the wave conditions in the training data is needed to generalize the model to unseen conditions, at least for conditions that fall within our envelope of realistic conditions. However, when you go from the smaller training data set with 10 measured wave conditions to 22, you can see a, a drop in the RMS reduction from 0.39 to 0.32 on this unique test data set. It remains to be seen if the RMS values would see a similar drop if we doubled the training data set size again. And overall, these RMS values are comparable to other time lapse inversion methods, especially when considering the 860 meter distance offshore being considered in this RMS calculation when the width of the surf zone is usually a fraction of that distance. There's still a lot of research goals currently in development and analysis in our research group. The first is wave condition inputs into the network to get better test results. While we are currently using RGB bands, grayscale bands have also been tried and found to be about as effective as RGB bands for the synthetic data set. And because offshore wave conditions such as wave height, wave direction and wave frequency are available all over the world due to global wave and tide models, evaluating whether they would be useful input features to improve the RMS is of interest on this synthetic data set before we move on to real imagery. We have input these features as quadrants into an additional band to be input into the U2Net architecture with the results including slope as an input being reported in this presentation. We also plan to analyze the uncertainty of the model and what it tells us about the interpretability of it. Here's an example of uncertainty prediction developed by running an ensemble of predictions through the network. You can see that the uncertainty is relatively higher where there are little breaking waves, especially in the trough, and then seaward of the sandbar. You can clearly see dips in uncertainty where there is more information about the depth contours through breaking wave gradients. However, there are still effects to be looked at, such as like uncertainty spikes along the edges in general, though these type of problems on the edges are documented issues with CNN. You can see here and in previous examples that in general, areas with breaking waves or less breaking waves have higher RMS. So we believe that by incorporating video frame data into the final model, it could conceivably increase or increase the accuracy. This is because wave celerity or wave speed is linear proportional to water depth in shallow water. So in areas where there are no breaking waves, incorporating this propagation, this wave propagation information into the model could reduce the RMS in these areas. And then finally, the goal is to use transfer learning with all of these inputs discussed on real images of the surf zone. Because of the similarity in these raw Solaris images and raw images of the surf zone, we're hoping to exploit the higher level feature extraction learned by the model trained on the synthetic data set to then fine tune with the smaller real data sets that are available. And uh, I would just like to acknowledge Hassan Tavakal and Pat Lynette for creating the Solaris model. Uh, Dr. Zhang Young Harry Lee for his assistance in a lot of this, Matthew Gayron for some of the bathymetry gener or generation scripts, as well as the faculty and graduate students at UNC Wilmington uh, for all of their support in this as well.